next on Outdoor Journal. They're coming back because the river is coming back. A log skitter in a river usually isn't a good thing, but in this case it's being used to restore trout habitat on southern Vermont's famed Baton Kill River, and the restoration efforts are paying off. We head north to Rutland County and visit the Pomainville Wildlife Management Area as our wild destination. Then we spend an evening in a unique yeah. high school biology lab where students learn the art and science of taxidermy. This program has been made possible by a generous grant from the Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department, conserving our fish, wildlife, plants, and their habitats for all Vermonters to enjoy. There we go. Nice shot. Vermont is home to many productive trout streams, but none as famous as the Batten Kill. For more than 150 years, the river's reputation for producing big brown trout and beautiful brook trout has lured anglers to southwest Vermont. For many years, the Batten Kill was managed with great success as a wild trout stream, but in the mid-1990s, a dramatic decline in the number of yearling trout in the 5 to 10 inch range had biologists, anglers, and others scrambling for answers. Thanks to a lot of hard work from a variety of groups, efforts are now underway to restore the bat and kill as one of New England's premier wild trout waters. A log skitter and bucket loader operating in the middle of one of Vermont's most treasured rivers is truly a bizarre sight and usually a source of habitat destruction. But these machines are actually working to restore the river and undo years of man-caused changes. What we're trying to do is improve the cover and shelter, the habitat for the brown trout here on the Batten Kill. And in order to do that, we're bringing in root wads, boulders, slate, and whole trees to sort of replicate what you'd see in a natural system. The Green Mountain National Forest has been involved with stream restoration since the 1980s. What its biologists have learned over the years is being put to good use on the Batten Kill, even though to untrained eyes, it looks like they're cluttering up the river. A lot of folks look at our headwater streams and they look pristine, they look beautiful, uh, they're, they're, they're clean looking, they don't have any woody debris in them. But that's not how streams would naturally function in our mountainous, forested watersheds. Naturally, there should be wood in there. And that's what we're trying to mimic, that's what we're trying to restore. It wasn't long ago that the Batten Kill attracted some of the country's most renowned fly fishermen, anglers like Lee Wolf and John Atherton. And it's no coincidence that the Orvis Company and the American Museum of Fly Fishing are located almost within casting range of the river. The Batten Kill's great fishing also led to the creation of numerous inns and B&Bs that cater to anglers. Marty Oakland, a passionate fly fisherman, fishing guide, and innkeeper at the Quill Gordon has fond memories of the Batten Kill's glory years. You know, this is Norman Rockwell country here. This is the tail end of the Taconics. It's beautiful. You know, it's really, really, really a, a, a fantastic fishery. Even in the 50s and 60s, when the Batten Kill was considered one of the top five trout streams in the country, it was very, very challenging. People like Lee Wolf would come out of here at night just shaking their heads. And these German brown trout were smart, and we had a lot of them back then. The Batten Kill was so well known and such a consistent producer that when the fishing began to decline, it caught many people, including anglers, by surprise. If you remember, back in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, outdoor life, field and stream, sports of field, fly fishing magazines, you know, everything, every article was written on the Batten Kill. Then there was this void for many years because the population disappeared. What I don't understand is, and I have asked the biologists this, what happened to the fish? 
In the mid-1990s, the Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department began noting a sharp decrease in angler catch rates, and stream surveys indicated that the number of yearling trout in the 5 to 10 inch range had declined by 70%. This sudden drop had biologists and anglers scrambling for answers. Everything from diseases to water quality issues were examined. One by one, uh, we basically dismissed um, um, the role of um, most of the factors with the exception of uh, fish cover or shelter habitat in the river. And we found that it was well below what the literature suggested a wild trout stream should have to maintain a healthy population. Boaters, swimmers, and even inexperienced anglers often consider woody debris an eyesore, if not a nuisance. However, it provides critical cover for trout and other aquatic species. Conflicts between anglers and canoeists, stream bank clearing and erosion, and other concerns led to the creation of a local organization with the mission of addressing these problems and restoring the Baton Kills fishery. The Baton Kill Watershed Alliance really was formed to try to coordinate the activities of all the different stakeholders. This includes landowners, anglers, local governments, voters, state and federal agencies. And we've been very, very effective in doing that. And it's only because of the partnerships that we've been able to accomplish what we have. We have now restored about a mile and a half of the main stem of the Baton Kill in West Darlington. We've stabilized banks and restored meanders for about a mile or a mile and a half in New York. We've really accomplished a tremendous amount working together to achieve common goals. In 2005, with willing landowners on board, partners at the ready, and funding in place, the restoration of the Batten Kill began taking shape. We have a lot of existing habitat for young of the year. That's that channel margin, shallow, moving water with a lot of um, small rocks and cobbles. And we also have habitat for the larger fish, those 18 to 20 inch brown trout, you know, can find cover in the deeper pools and they're less subject to predation from mergansers, otters, mink, that sort of thing. But it's that yearling class of fish, that 6 to 11 inch fish, that there's not a lot of cover for those fish in the rivers to, you know, to seek refuge from predation. So the, the wood, the boulders, uh, whole trees, they create those spaces or cover and shelter in order to escape predation and um, hide out like that. Five years after the first section was restored, it has plenty of cover and the natural look of a forested stream with lots of woody debris along its margins. Prior to any of this work being done here, this section of river was not all that different from much of the rest of the Batten Kill. It was a fairly straight section of river. It had pool habitat, which is your deeper, slower water habitat, and it had a riffle habitat, which is that very shallow, higher gradient um, sections of stream with the, uh, the broken water surface. But when you looked at the stream, outside of some deep water, there was no structure in the channel to provide fish and other aquatic organisms with shelter, a place for them to hide and to conserve energy resources. And what we did was take a, a vacant lot and instead of trying to ask fish to live on a vacant lot, we built a house. In 2005, before any habitat work was done on the river, electrofishing surveys showed that this section held 110 yearling fish per mile. By 2010, the yearling population had grown to over 500 fish per mile, while the trout population in nearby sections that were not restored did not change. Where we have constructed cover, we are holding those yearling-sized fish, and we're hopeful um, that as this, this continues that we're going to see uh, um, that translate up into larger size fish right through the population. In addition to the habitat work, a special catch and release regulation has been in place on the Batten Kill since 2000, which has helped produce more large fish. As word spreads and more anglers return to the river, the impact will be felt well beyond its banks. If we could turn the clock back 
to before the decline of the brown trout population, I could have retired 20 years ago because we would have been filled with fishermen from the 1st of May through the foliage season. And every B&B &B in Manchester, Sunderland, and Arlington, and hotel would have had the same. It used to be that every pull-off, there was a Massachusetts, a Connecticut, a New York car. You just don't see it anymore. They're coming back because the river is coming back. But it, if, if we could just get, it's such an economic resource to this area, I just, I just wish it would really turn on. Although biologists are seeing gratifying results, when it comes to restoring riverine habitat, nothing happens overnight. It's too early to say that the Battenkill River is back, but without a doubt, the fishery is improving thanks to the ongoing habitat restoration program. Our long-term strategy is for the riparian areas to mature, to provide the shade, the organic material, and the large woody debris into these streams in the natural process. We're trying to jumpstart it in places to evaluate and understand how the biology works when you put wood into the stream, how the fish respond, how the bugs respond, how the river channels respond. My very early projects, some of them worked really well, um, and I like to go back to those and look at them. I like to go back and fish them. Uh, I really enjoy going back to them and, and snorkeling and looking at how the fish are using the structures that I put in. And it's, uh, it feels great to see some of these things that have worked. There is a lot of brook trout. They're coming back. We did, we caught some nice, you know, 10, 11 inches like that. That's, and they're beautiful, they're gorgeous. But these batten kill browns, they are the healthiest, most beautiful trout. You know, the colors of these, of the batten kill brown, that gold with those big red spots, there's nothing like it. I've never seen a trout, you know, in the Walloom sack or the Hoosick or the Meadowee. You know, these batten kill browns are just pretty. They are just, and they bite. God, they're strong. They're really, really strong. The fishery is improving. I think we've got um, more years to go. It's not something that's going to change overnight. Uh, it's a long process to rebuild uh, a fishery naturally, but I, we're going to end up with um, what we had before, a wild brown and brook trout fishery that has a lot of value to it in terms of uh, how the anglers perceive it and experience it but I think other people in the community and local area that benefit from it in other ways. The Pomainville Wildlife Management Area in Pittsburgh covers 360 acres of former farmland along the east bank of the Otter Creek. Thanks to partnerships with the Pomainville family, Ducks Unlimited, and other conservation groups, this unique property was acquired by the Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department in 2005. Its diverse habitats are now being managed and restored for the benefit of both wildlife and fish. One of the unique things about the Pomainville WMA in Pittsburgh is that its management plan is geared both towards wildlife restoration and fisheries restoration. Pomainville was a farm that was actively worked and all those fields were hayed and so they were ditched and drained to get the floodwaters in the spring off those hay fields very, very quickly. The, the problem with that is that fish populations in Otter Creek rise with the floodwaters and recede with the floodwaters and a lot of uh, fish species utilize or need flooded grasslands for uh, spawning habitat and one of the most popular fish or common fish to use those sorts of areas is northern pike. When actively farmed, these fields would drain rapidly after spring flooding, more often than not leaving fish eggs high and dry. The installation of three water control structures restored 46 acres of open water and emergent marsh, providing great habitat for young pike to hatch and grow before dropping into the creek during the next spring flood. After restoration, State biologists saying the wetlands that confirm their importance as fish nursery habitat. We found hundreds of little two and a half to three inch pike. Very healthy, eating a lot of aquatic insects that were also becoming part of the natural impoundments there through the restoration. We went back again at the end of the summer and that was my next concern is okay these things are spawning, they're obviously hatching, here we are in the spring. What is the summer going to do to these fish? You know, are these ponds deep enough to hold enough water so that those fish survive? Do they get too hot or do they stay cool enough? So we went back into November and we did 
repeated the same sampling effort with the same nets and we found you know four five and six inch pike so those pike not only survived but they thrived and I was surprised not only to find pike in those impoundments but I found uh, enormous schools of golden shiners, uh, small, you know, two-inch yellow perch, uh, bluegill, and emerald shiners, blunt-nosed minnows. There's a whole fish community uh, appearing in these impoundments now. The restored wetlands also provide critical nesting, roosting, and feeding habitat for migratory waterfowl and wading birds, as well as other wetland-dependent wildlife. Old fields on the WMA that are not flooded are managed for a variety of grassland bird species like baba lynx and savanna sparrows by annually mowing the fields well after young birds have fledged. The other thing that we're doing along the Otter Creek on the Pomainville ownership is establishing a wider forested buffer along the Otter Creek itself for several hundred feet where we're actively going in and planting uh, species like silver maples and some elms and some ash to widen that forested buffer along the creek and uh, again those riparian those riparian areas immediately adjacent to the creek are are highly valued by a lot of wildlife species and we think it'll enhance those wildlife values significantly by uh, establishing that riparian zone. The Pomainville WMA showcases a variety of habitat enhancement techniques that can be used by private landowners. In just a few years, this easily accessible WMA off US Route 7 has become a hotspot for wildlife and people who enjoy hunting and watching wildlife as a result of active habitat management. Getting high school students excited about science can be a challenge, especially if it requires staying after school. This looks real good. This is perfect, Chad. You did a heck of a job right here. But at Otter Valley Union High School in Brandon, Vermont, there's one biology teacher who has developed a program that has students looking forward to staying after school. Every day is an adventure in this room. Every single day. Brad Froloff avid deer hunter and 30-year teacher at Otter Valley has infused his love for the outdoors into a unique hands-on program that introduces students to the art and science of taxidermy. Back in the mid 80s I noticed that Cabela's had a, a sale of uh, deer mount kits that uh, were relatively inexpensive. You could get everything you needed to mount a deer for $35. So I ordered three of them thinking I'd try with one and then maybe I'd have two to work with students with. And uh, my son, he was three at the time, we put my first four-point buck together with a different cape because the deer was shot back in the 70s. It's now mid-80s. Put it together on the kitchen table and uh, the next year I used the other two kits with students here at school and it progressed from there. The after-school program has grown from only a handful of students each year in the 1980s to up to 15 kids in two sessions today. Some years there's even a waiting list. To me, this kind of a program offers a multifaceted kind of uh, benefit. Um, students are working with their hands in a deft way to create an artistic form. So there's definitely art involved, but it, it all starts with a lot of them out in the woods. So it, it enhances that natural history involvement. Uh, it enhances the, the whole aspect of, of utilizing something of the deer that, that would normally not have been used at all. Uh, the steak for supper tastes good, but this is something that they'll remember for the rest of their lives. And it's a, a talent that they can bring beyond this classroom. Uh, it involves biology, it involves art, it involves natural history. It, it's a well-rounded kind of a project. Most students mount a game head, and they do every step of the process, including one of the more difficult tasks, called fleshing. Before the hide, or cape, can be tanned, all extra tissue must be carefully removed with a scalpel. You're going to be fine. That, that's going to fit fine. You've got plenty of space. Brad's constant reassurances help the students overcome their doubts and complete tasks they would otherwise never try. Bring the hide over to the table over here and I'll show you what you need to do. That, that's going to fit on there perfectly. That's going to work just like that. Let's get them upside down on a tabletop. I'll mark it and we'll get some glue on there. 
It's demanding work that requires a lot of patience and concentration, yet Brad keeps the kids both engaged and relaxed. Well, just don't sew your finger into the hide because that'll look strange on the wall. <laughs> I, that would not be good. Although most of the students work on an animal that they or a family member harvested, you don't have to come from a hunting background to enroll in the class. I would say about 25% of the students that go through this program have never set foot in the deer woods to hunt deer. They've never done that. And so this is definitely a stretch for that 25%. Uh, but they're students and they are risk takers and they've seen what ha other students have done in past years uh, and they're, they're anxious to try something new and try a new challenge. It's an incredible project for them to, to do that on. Participating in this program is a real time commitment, but the students have no regrets. I think this is a pretty good deal because I get to mount my own deer, and then since I have Mr. Froloff as a teacher, I get some extra credit in the end, so it's all worth it. Well, I'm not getting credit for it because I'm not in any of Mr. Froloff's classes, but it's fun, so I decided to do it, and I wanted to do my buck. I'm in uh, Mr. Froloff's biology class, so I'm getting credit, but that's not why I'm doing it. I'm just doing it because I thought it'd be fun. The credit is just a bonus. Each student will spend anywhere from 30 to 40 hours working on their mounts, while Brad devotes up to 200 hours to the taxidermy program, getting everything ready, teaching the students, and working on his own demonstration mount. For me, it's a labor of love. In terms of how many hours a year I put into this, uh, you might get a different estimate from my wife as you would get from me. My deer season begins with archery in October, my personal deer season, and whether or not I'm successful uh, the week right after muzzle, taxidermy starts with my students. And uh, as a rule, that goes through May before it's all done. So it's a all school year, a couple days a week, uh, you know, post regular deer season and uh, a very, very understanding spouse. Over the years, the program has produced a wide assortment of mounts, everything from an otter to a moose. The class not only attracts an assortment of wildlife species, it also inspires a wide spectrum of students who are willing to put in the time and take on the challenges that come with learning taxidermy. The, the more uh, disciplines we can pull in, the more facets of life that we can pull into this, the more meaningful the actual product is to the students. You know, they can relate to it. Uh, these students have been working here since 2.30 this afternoon. It's now uh, 7 p.m. They've got about another hour and a half to go. And, uh, you know, they're, they're, uh, they're hard at it. They're, they're looking forward to completion, but uh, just by looking at their faces, uh, these are dedicated individuals right here, and the next batch starts on Monday. How's this going here anyway, Tyler? Uh, I think it's uh, pretty good. Cheekers, I gotta tell you, this is excellent. You've done a heck of a job here. This looks real. After hours of intimately working with an individual mount, a lot is learned about the animal. Stories are shared, and a lot of discussion takes place as the work is done. He could have been fighting, you know, this could have been before before you even uh, saw him in the first place. And again, right in there. I mean, he definitely, you know, was a fighter. Each mount in its own way also helps connect the students to the broader natural world that surrounds Otter Valley Union High School. We're all Vermonters, and this is our environment that we are extending in the work that we're doing right here. So uh, male, female, hunter, non-hunter, there's, there's something in this program for everybody. Over the course of several weeks and dozens of hours spent after school, the mounts begin to take on their final shape, as do the students' impressions of taxidermy. It looks good. Uh, where I started, it was just like this empty, flat cape, and now it's starting to look like the real life thing again. So, pretty interesting. My favorite part probably is almost at the end when we're taking the pins out, painting the eyes and the antlers, making it look just shiny, and then being able to take it home and showing off what you have. It's fun. It's, uh, it's a good hands-on project, and I'd recommend it to anyone who wants to do it.
The enthusiasm that Brad exhibits in the class rubs off on students in different ways. While the program's impact on each individual can vary, the one constant is that every student leaves with a personal piece of work that he or she is very proud of. As passionate as Brad is about taxidermy, it's the smiles on his students' faces when they pose with their finished mount that inspires him to offer the program year after year. Every single individual that does this program will turn out an incredible product that, that they will admire for the rest of their lives. And uh, they're taxidermists, every single one of them. For more information on this or any other Outdoor Journal segment, be sure to visit our website at vpt.org. Our site features video on demand, contact information, and links to related sites. You can call, write, or email us, and as always, we look forward to your comments and suggestions. This program has been made possible by a generous grant from the Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department, conserving our fish, wildlife, plants, and their habitats for all Vermonters to enjoy.